In this video, we're going to talk about E. coli. E. coli is um, a bacterial organism that I'm sure all of you have heard about before. Um, it is the most common and the most important member of the Enterobacteriaceae. So that's the first thing you need to know about E. coli is that it is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae. So it follows kind of the same rules, it has some of the same characteristics, and that is helpful in its identification. So I mentioned the Enterobacteriaceae for the first time in the Robert May case, and then if you haven't already watched it, go ahead and watch the Enterobacteriaceae video where I go into the main characteristics of all of the members of that family. So what about E. coli in particular? So as I already mentioned, it's the most common and most important member. This one causes a whole bunch of nasty pathologies. Everything from kind of self-limited, no big deal gastroenteritis, what you would consider your run-of-the-mill you know, food poisoning, to really debilitating food poisoning that can lead to things like sepsis and death. Um, it's also the most common cause of urinary tract infections and in some people can even lead to meningitis, um, as you found out with Miriam Kahn. So this is a pretty important bug. There's a whole bunch of strains of this one. So we already talked about this a bit in the Enterobacteriaceae video, but remember that E. coli can be kind of classified based on its O and H antigens, right? So the O antigen is part of the LPS, that we see in the gram-negative cell wall structure. And the H are basically antigens that are part of the flagella. So as I showed in that silly cartoon image at the beginning of this video, this is a flagellated organism and it has O and H antigens. Um, so you could have O1, H1, all the way to however many serotypes there are. So there is some antigenic variability in these O and H strains. Um, and some of these O and H strains um, are associated with more severe disease or likelihood for more severe disease. Um, one of the things also to note about these various O and H strains um, are that they are associated sometimes with significant antibiotic resistance, making them very difficult to kill. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a member of the Enterobacteriaceae family. So what does that mean? Well, that means it's catalase positive, like all the other Enterobacteriaceae and oxidase -like negative, like all the other bacteriaceae. Um, it's a gram-negative rod, so that means you can grow it on McConkie. And this is one of the Enterobacteriaceae that is lactose fermentative. Um, so you can see the nice pink to red colonies, which indicate that it is lactose fermentative positive, so it's able to do that. It is not able to ferment sorbitol. So I didn't mention sorbitol in the Enterobacteriaceae video, but basically just like McConkie is infused with lactose, um, in this case, they use McConkie auger, but instead of lactose, they infuse it with sorbitol. And they see if with that same pH indicator, if the organism can ferment it. And if it's able to ferment it, just like on McConkie, it'll turn pink or red. Um, most of the pathogenic E. coli strains are unable to ferment sorbitol. So that makes them smack negative. Um, and the E. coli that we're going to talk today are generally smack negative. So those are kind of your main characteristics regarding um, E. coli. So how do we get sick with E. coli? Well, there's a couple of ways. First off, keep in mind that E. coli is part of our normal microbiota. There are plenty of people who just have E. coli growing in their gastrointestinal tract because it's an enterobacteriaceae. A lot of those grow in our GI tract and cause no problems. So occasionally you'll get what's called an opportunistic infection. This occurs when E. coli from the GI tract are transmitted to a site they're not supposed to be. So the GI tract, you're allowed to have all sorts of, um, you know, creatures living in it and it doesn't cause you any damage. But eventually, if let's say the E. coli from there get out and go to, say, your brain or to the, uh, the urinary tract, that's where it's going to cause infection. So anytime we have a microorganism that lives happily in one side of our body, but causes disease in another side of the body, that's called an endogenous infection, okay? So this is an infection, nobody gave it to us, we gave it to ourselves 
when the bacteria moved from a site that it's okay to be in and went to a site where it's not supposed to be, so when it's been displaced. So how does this happen? Well, the most common way is um, either trauma or displacement. Um, so something happened to dislodge it, so like say, um, a perforation of the bowel. If uh, you have a bowel perforation, you're certainly going to have some of these microbes leak out into the bloodstream, um, going to places that they shouldn't be. Um, or if you just have displacement. So um, with uh, little kids getting urinary tract infections, maybe not wiping correctly, um, poor hygiene, things like that. So that's one way. Sometimes you can get virulence factor acquisition. So literally that just means that the E. coli that previously were not causing you any harm or maybe, you know, you were never exposed to, but even if you had been, they wouldn't have been pathogenic, have acquired something that makes them pathogenic. Um, and that typically happens through a plasmid. Um, if they acquire a plasmid that has some sort of virulence factor that suddenly makes them better at adhering to our epi epithelial cells, um, then they're able to stay there and grow and cause disease or because the plasmid contains a toxin and the toxin is what's causing disease. So not necessarily the bacteria itself, but the toxin it produces. Um, e. coli are a really important organism to know. Um, they are the most commonly isolated organism from septic patients. Um, so they're a big cause of sepsis. They're responsible for 80% of the UTIs that we see. Um, many nosocomial infections and a really prominent cause of gastroenteritis um, and uh, with the exception of neonatal meningitis and gastroenteritis, they're almost always endogenous infections like I was talking about over here. So what kind of diseases do we see? So I've already mentioned the UTIs, so I'm not going to belabor that very much, just that they originate in the colon and they somehow contaminate the urethra, ascend into the bladder, and may even migrate into the kidney or the prostate. Um, this is especially associated um, with patients on catheters. Anytime you have a patient on a catheter, there's a higher likelihood of infection. We certainly see that with um, UTIs. We also see it in young kids. Um, kids who are just kind of figuring out how that happens. But really, you can see E. coli-based UTIs in any patient of any age. It's a pretty common one. Um, neonatal meningitis, this is a pretty concerning one. Um, e. coli and group B strep are kind of your big concerns for this one. They cause the majority of CNS infections in infants that are younger than one month of age. Um, Almost 75% of the E. coli strains possess this K1 capsular antigen. So remember I mentioned in the Enterobacteriaceae video that we use O and H for serotyping most of the time. Even though we make antibodies to K, we don't typically follow it. This is one of the few ones that we do, this K1, um, because it's known to be associated with neonatal meningitis. Um, this serogroup is also commonly present in the GI tracts of pregnant women, which is part of how it's transmitted, obviously, to newborn infants. Um, big concern for septicemia typically occurs as a result of an infection that originated as a UTI or a gastrointestinal infection and then somehow crossed into the bloodstream and then went on to cause disease. Um, mortality associated with E. coli septicemia is high, especially in immunocompromised patients or um, if the primary infection actually originated in the abdomen, that increases the mortality or the CNS, obviously, because anytime you have bacterial meningitis, that's a pretty serious situation. Um, the last one that we associate with E. coli is gastroenteritis. This is actually one of the more common ones. So gastroenteritis and UTI, those are the ones that are a big deal for E. coli that we see a lot, um, not so much in morbidity, but just in um, how often you'll see a patient that has an E. coli infection. Um, all strains of E. coli can cause gastroenteritis, but they appear differently and manifest differently depending on the strain. And we're gonna go into more detail on the different strains of E. coli and how that affects the presentation of gastroenteritis. All right, so this is what I mean when I say that there are different types of gastrointestinal infection that are associated with basically different types of E. coli. Um, so they each have these little acronyms. 
So ETEC is enterotoxigenic E. coli. Um, this is most often referred to as traveler's diarrhea. Um, so that might be a way you've heard of it. There's EHEC, which is also STEC. Um, EHEC refers to enterohemorrhagic E. coli or Shiga toxin producing E. coli. Um, so the Shiga toxin is almost identical to the Shiga toxin that is produced by Shigella, a different member of the Enterobacteriaceae, um, but in this case it's being produced by E. coli. Um, and then there's enteroaggregative E. coli, which basically they just have a virulence factor that allows them to have this kind of stacked brick appearance in the way that they adhere to the uh, epithelial cells of our small intestine, and that's kind of how they take up residence and cause disease. Um, there's enteropathogenic E. coli and enteroinvasive E. coli. And as I mentioned, each one has its own virulence factors that are associated with it that usually relate to its ability to adhere to our small intestine or its ability to produce a toxin, which then leads to the disease that we associate with it. Okay, so I have some charts here that kind of go into the different types of toxins and adhesion factors that are associated with each strain or um, each type of E. coli. So up here, we've got enteropathogenic E. coli. Um, they have what's known as the BFP, which is basically its ability to cling to the cells, um, cling to our epithelial cells. So this is the bundle forming pili. Um, BFP is bundle forming pili. And that just enables it to hold on a little bit tighter to our cells. It also has this intamin um, that also is involved in its pathology. And this is part of what allows it to aggregate on our cells. Um, so then you've got enterotoxigenic E. coli. So enterotoxigenic E. coli, as I mentioned, this one's associated with travelers um, more than anybody else. And you've got both adhesive factors and exotoxins. So you've got colonization factors, CFA, which basically just allow it to attach to our cells well. And then you've got two toxins. You've got a heat label toxin known as LT1, and you've got a heat stable toxin known as STA. Um, and this STA, it's not a Shiga toxin in this case because you're not gonna get bloody diarrhea with this one. You're just gonna get watery diarrhea here. Um, and then you've got EIEC, enteroinvasive toxins. So with EIEC, we're going to see an invasive plasmid antigen, um, which basically enables it to actually go into our cells. They also have a hemolysin, <laughs> hemolysin A. And then you've got enterohemorrhagic type, um, type E. coli, or EHEC. This one is also sometimes known as STEC, and they literally have the Shiga toxin. So you're still gonna have watery diarrhea, but on top of all of the high volume, you're also gonna have bloody diarrhea because it works the same way. And then you've got enteroaggregative, and they're showing that really nicely, how the E. coli are aggregating right here. Um, but this also just shows, remember, that they, they've got that stacked brick appearance. Um, and that's because they've got this aggregative adherence fimbrae that allow them to stay together. Um, they also have some toxins. They have a heat-stable toxin, and they also have a plasmid-encoded toxin that are involved with their pathogenesis. Okay, so we're going to start with ETEC. This is sometimes referred to as Montezuma's revenge. Um, so this is a infection uh, that affects about 30% of travelers each year um, to areas where uh, this strain of E. coli is endemic. And certainly one of those places is um, Mexico, as well as other um, warm weather climates. Um, it's acquired through consumption. It's a fecal oral transmission. So if you have fecally contaminated food or water, um, then it can obviously lead to transmission of the bacteria. Basically, you've got a one to two day incubation before um, the patient experiences a watery, non-bloody diarrhea. Now that's not always the case. So that's kind of like the textbook case. But if you have the bacteria within the water for a like prolonged period of time. So let's say this is our glass of water, right, right here. And then you've got your organism 
that's inside the water. I can't really see that. So you've got your organism inside the water here. If the organism is producing its toxin, its heat stable toxin or its STA toxin, then that's a preformed toxin. And anytime you have a preformed toxin, you can have symptoms show up in minutes to hours. Um, so it just kind of depends on the load that's present in there and if the toxin has already been formed. Um, so, but standard is that a patient would develop it within one to two days after exposure and last for three to five days. Um, the symptoms are a watery, non-bloody diarrhea, often associated with abdominal pain and cramping um, that uh, is associated with some nausea and vomiting. We do see some mortality with this one, particularly in patients who are malnourished, maybe already dehydrated, um, children and the elderly. Um, children, they're just so little, so they don't have as much, you know, blood volume that they have the ability to lose any. Um, but yeah, this one, you're going to be thinking of kind of a short time course. So it can be minutes to hours up to about one to two days. Um, okay, so toxins. There's kind of two sets of toxins, right? So you've got your heat-stable STA toxins. STA is the only one that's actually associated with human disease. Um, it causes an increase in cyclic GMP, which is guanosine monophosphate. Um, and basically, guanosine monophosphate, monophosphate regulates secretion of fluids. So anytime you have an increase in it, you're going to have hypersecretion of fluid. And that hypersecretion of fluid um, is associated with an inhibition of fluid absorption. So that gives you what's called high volume diarrhea. So anytime you have really watery diarrhea, you're thinking about high volume diarrhea. Um, okay, and then you've got the heat labile toxins, LT1 and LT2. LT1 is more often associated with human disease. This one works a lot like cholera toxin. Um, so LT1 binds to the same receptor as cholera toxin, which is the GM1 gangliosides, and these are on epithelial cells, and we've got a whole bunch of them in our small intestines. So our small intestines are kind of a site for this interaction. So the toxin interacts with first GM1, and then it integrates, or it interacts with the membrane protein GS, and GS actually is what regulates adenylate cyclase. So adenylate cyclase, you're going to hear me talk about cyclic AMP and adenylate cyclase a lot. So the net effect of this interaction is an increase in cyclic AMP. When you have an increase in cyclic AMP levels, you wind up with enhanced secretion of chloride, so chloride goes out, um, and decreased absorption, so you're not getting enough back in of sodium and chloride as well. So basically your net effect is low chloride, low sodium, and that's gonna also lead to watery, high volume diarrhea. Um, this toxin is also somewhat inflammatory. It stimulates prostaglandin secretion, and production of inflammatory cytokines, which basically furthers the fluid loss that you expect with it. All right, we're gonna hit EPEC and EAEC um, on the same slide here. So EPEC causes enteric disease. Um, these organisms are characterized by the presence of the locus of enterocyte effacement, or LEE. -E. So what does that mean? Um, Basically, they're able to attach to our enterocytes really well, um, which are within our gastrointestinal tract. It's just a fa fancy way of saying that. They don't have shiga toxin, so we don't have to worry about that. And once again, the disease is acquired by the fecal oral route, so contaminated water. We're the, it's our fault that we have this disease. We are the reservoir. We are the entire show for this one. Um, we are the only source. Um, and with the other animals, we are, they are also a reservoir, but we are kind of the main source and major reservoir of it. Um, disease occurs predominantly in children under the age of two, and it's associated once again with a watery diarrhea that's accompanied with fever and vomiting. This one's typically self-limited. We don't really have to worry too much about this one. Um, you won't even see patients come in for it. Um, and if you do, you're probably not going to do anything about it. You probably won't even know it's EPEC because you probably won't do a culture on it because it's pretty, it's fairly mild. 
Um, and this one is due basically to the bundle forming pili. Remember that BFP, which just basically allows it to attach really well. EAEC, um, we don't really have a marker for these bacteria. Um, all we know is that they give us that stacked brick appearance on the small intestine. So we can kind of identify them if we were to look at a tissue sample. Um, that's how you can find them. Um, but other than that, these, there are a few bacteria in this group that are associated with chronic diarrhea. And they've actually also been associated with um, growth retardation in some children, um, mainly because when they form this stacked brick in the small intestine, they can actually affect nutrient um, absorption a bit. Um, but what they're mainly known for doing is causing basically an inflammatory diarrhea. You get cytokine release. Um, you can occasionally see neutrophilia with this. Um, symptoms include a watery secretory diarrhea that's accompanied with fever and nausea and vomiting and pain. Um, this process can either be really acute and just kind of pass, much like EPEC, or it can lead to a persistent chronic infection. Um, that is more likely to occur in children, and that's why we occasionally see effects on growth um, to patients that are immunocompromised, like the HIV positive population. All right, now we're going to move on to what I consider kind of one of the more important um, varieties of E. coli. This would be EHEC or STEC, however you want to refer to it. But this is your enterohemorrhagic bacterial um, bacteria ester E. coli. Um, so most E. coli strains, as I mentioned, are harmless, but we do have this enterohemorrhagic EHEC, which can be pretty um, significant. Um, it's a sub, so EHEC is a subset of um, STEC. Um, so STEC are basically shiga toxin producing E. coli. So that's uh, brought up as STX1 or STX2 is how you'll see that written. Um, the most commonly associated serotype that's EHEC is O157H7. This is the EHEC variety that we worry about. Even though it's responsible for less than 50% of the serotypes of disease, it's kind of a significant minority. Um, and with EHEC, you can see mild, uncomplicated diarrhea to hemorrhagic colitis. It just kind of depends what you get. Um, as I mentioned before, this STX is identical to the Shiga toxin that Shigella produces. Um, and the Shiga toxin in E. coli, when we see it in E. coli, it was acquired by a lysogenic bacteria phase, phage. If you have no clue what those two words I just said, lysogenic bacteriophage, mean, go back to Jamie Wilson and read the section on bacterial genetics and then contact me if you still have no clue what I'm talking about. But basically it's just, they basically got infected with a bacterial virus that happened to carry a toxin with them that they now use to their advantage. Um, so I guess that's making lemonade out of lemons, I don't know. Okay, so both STX1 and the STX2, they work the exact same way as Shiga toxin. And what they do is they, I'm just going to delete everything. So STX1 and STX2, they're going to bind to GB3. That's their receptor. So GB3 is a specific glycolipid that's found on our host cells. And we have a really, really high concentration of these on our intestinal villi. So um, we see a lot of these in that area. So it makes it really easy for the toxin to bind there. Um, and the other place we see a whole bunch of GB3 are on renal cells. So that could should give you a clue that even though we associate EHEC with a gastrointestinal infection, there could be some complications for renal function. Once it's bound to GB3, it gets internalized and it gets cleaved into two molecules. And one of those molecules is known as A1. And A1 is able to bind to the 28S portion of our RNA. So what does that mean? This is a really fancy way of saying that it basically stops proteins. It stops protein synthesis because if you block 28S rRNA, you're inhibiting protein synthesis. The other thing that STX does is that it's highly inflammatory. So you get a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines made to this um, toxin. And that's actually kind of interesting when you think about it 
from a renewal and repair standpoint. So Dr. Poole talks about this when he talks about tissue repair. But anytime you have inflammation, you have damage. And whenever you have damage, you need to fix the tissue. Well, how are you supposed to fix the tissue if you have no protein? So it's a really smart toxin in that way, that it's doing damage in such a way that like you are damaging yourself it's just not letting you fix it, which I always find very elegant when pathogens work in such a way where we're actually mediating all the damage. Um, okay, so what are the symptoms associated with this one? The incubation period is anywhere from three to eight days. Average is three to four days, so it's a little bit shorter than this graphic has. Um, about 50% of patients will experience vomiting. Um, and then that will occur typically without fever, but it's a 50-50 shot. Some of them will have fever, but fever isn't always evident. Within about two days of that, you're gonna have what's called bloody diarrhea, which is just what it sounds like. Um, so you can determine that just by looking at it, or you might do like a GWAC test. Um, so it, it kind of depends. If the patient is going to be fine and you don't treat them and you don't need to do anything for them, then you'll have complete resolution within about four to 10 days where the patient just recovers and all is well. But it can get pretty rough for a little bit. Um, often patients are hospitalized with this one, not all the time, but um, we do see it from time to time. Um, okay, so the other thing that occasionally happens with this one is hemolytic uremic syndrome. So what is hemolytic uremic syndrome? So I mentioned up here that GB3, which is what sugar toxin binds to, is also present on renal endothelial cells. So hem hemolytic uremic syndrome is a disorder basically characterized by acute renal failure. Um, so we'll see acute renal failure and thrombocytopenia, um, which basically means lacking platelets. Um, so this is a complication that affects anywhere from five to 10% of specifically children under the age of 10. And death from hemolytic uremic syndrome is actually um, not insignificant. It's three to 5% of patients who develop pus. Um, and it's associated with this hypertension, renal impairment, and sometimes you'll even see CNS manifestations. Um, those will occur in about 30% of HUS patients. Um, and the HUS is specifically associated with STX2 more than STX1, um, but that one's actually better able to bind to and destroy glomerular epithelial cells. Um, so that's kind of the entirety of EHEC. So for all of the E. coli um, that we have just talked about, how do we diagnose it? Well, the gold standard is culture. Um, all members of Enterobacteriaceae grow readily in culture. Um, McConkie is used typically to identify them first off as gram-negative rods, um, but then also whether or not they can ferment lactose, and these ones are lactopositive. So you'd see a lactopositive result on McConkie and then furthermore that they were SMAC negative, as I discussed at the beginning. Um, presence of toxin will tell you whether or not you're dealing with EHEC or STEC or EPEC or whatever. So to shiga or not to shiga, that is the question, because that's gonna tell you a lot, not only about the organism, but also whether or not you treat. Um, and then serotype. Serotype is really important because like I said earlier, some of these are really associated with more um, severe infections and none more than 0157H7. Um, so you can look for either the shiga toxin or remember that for travelers, there's that STA, STB um, that aren't shiga toxin, but we can also look for those for presence of those toxins, either by PCR or immunoassay. Um, those are your big methods for identifying toxins. Okay, treatment. Treatment is kind of hard with these guys. Um, first off, you're, you're not going to treat HUS or you're not going to treat EHEC because you're worried about HUS. Treatment of EHEC has been associated with prolonged fetal carriage and increased risk of HUS. So if you, are, if you know you have O157H7, you really need to make sure that you're not giving any antibiotic treatment there. Um, you're just gonna give supportive care. 
because you don't want to increase the chances of this kid developing HUS. Um, and any treatment decision you do make, you're only going to make based on susceptibility testing. Remember, these guys live in our gastrointestinal tract, so they have pretty high antibiotic resistance, and that's only growing. Um, at this point, we even have significant resistant to what are called extended spectrum beta lactamases. Um, and that has really affected the use of some of the carbapenem drugs that we used to rely on. So um, treatment of these guys is tricky. You'll need to do susceptibility testing and you're never going to treat HUS with antibiotics at this point.